When I was 11, I picked stock. I had the whole wrong idea. I was interested in watching stocks, and I thought stocks were things that went up and down, and I charted them. I read books on technical analysis. I read I, I read Edwards and McGee. I think that was the classic then. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And I read that whole thing over and over again. I read Garfield, Drew, and all that. I read everything. I thought the first eight years, I thought the important thing was to predict what a stock would do and predict the stock market. And then I read Ben Graham, you know, when I was 19 or 20. I realized that I was doing it exactly the wrong way. It didn't hurt that I had that background and everything. It rejiggered my mind. And when I read the book, The Intelligent Investor, at, from that point, I never bought another stock. I bought businesses that happened to be publicly traded. I became an owner of a business, and I did not, I did not care whether a stock went up or down the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. And I didn't have any idea what it would do. I didn't know what the stock market would do, but I knew businesses. I'm a bright guy who's terribly interested in what he does. I've spent a, a lifetime doing it. and I've surrounded myself with people that bring out the best in me. You don't need to be a genius in what I do. That's the good thing about it. If I went into physics or so, I, a whole lot of other subjects, I'd be an also ran, but I am in a game. You don't need, you probably need 120 points of IQ, you know, but you, but 170 doesn't do any better than 120. It may do worse, probably do worse, but you don't really need brains. What you, do you need? You need the right orientation. You know, 90% of the people, I'm putting a figure out of the air, but 90% of the people that buy stocks don't think of them the right way. They think about something that they hope goes up next week. <laughs> and they think about the market as something they hope goes up. And if it's down, they feel worse. I feel better. The company's going to be worth 10 or 20 years from now. And I hope it goes down when I buy it because I'll buy more. You got to be careful about what you compete in. It's a good thing I don't have a competitive spirit in chess or, you know, you know, or football or anything like that. No, no, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm an observer there. I enjoy watching things like that. I try to keep my competitive spirit in a game where I can win. Do you have a killer instinct? Nah, not exactly. I, I've got, I wouldn't call it a killer instinct, but I do, I do know this. When I want to do something, I always want to do it big. What does that I mean? put my whole net worth in City Service Preferred. You know, one hundred twenty dollars, one hundred fourteen dollars and seventy five cents. And I put my whole net worth in, in, and I've never since I was well since that day in March eleventh, uh, nineteen forty two. I have never had less than eighty percent of my money in American business. You can call them stocks or but equities, I, but I see them as American business. I, I've owned a piece of American business, eight, at least 80% at all times. In, you know, I, I just, I don't want to own anything else. <laughs> I, I want to own a home and you know, things my family wants and all that. Owning five homes doesn't mean anything to me because I'm, I can be happy in one home and, and there's a certain amount of things that go wrong with everything. And <laughs> if I got two homes, I've, I know I've got more problems and I don't have more happiness. <laughs> what brings you the happiness? I would have to be honestly say that what makes me happiest is what I'm doing, what I'm doing, you know. One, I know I'll win over time. That doesn't mean I'll beat everybody else or anything like that. But I'll, I mean, the game is very, very, very easy if you have the right lessons in your mind about what you're buying. I'm not buying stocks. I'm buying pieces of overwhelmingly American business. And I'm happy when that's happy, when that's when I'm doing it. I'm happy when stocks are going down. I'm happier when stocks are going down because I, I, I can buy more of them with the same amount of money. I'd be happy if I was a farmer. I'd want farmland to go down. Uh, so I could buy more acreage, you know, if I was, I mean, it just makes sense. And I'll, I'll tell you the second thing I really like. I like being trusted by people. I would rather do what I do with partners than do it sitting in a room myself, even though I might make more money that way. They're just as independent in buying things as I am. I mean, uh, if they decide, if they decide to buy something and a country I've never heard of in stock. They don't ask me. One of those, I've said it very clearly, and there's a letter on the 
on the website that describes exactly the circumstances because they got misreported in the press originally. And uh, so I have, it's very easy to look at the statistics on it. I mean, more people, a greater percentage of the American population is uh, wealthy now or having more income now than they've ever had. And if you look at whether Bank of America will give you their average deposit. I mean, you, you just look at the wealth. That doesn't mean everybody's wealthy, but it does mean relative to any other period of time, people have more money now. They get mortgages at lower rates than they've ever gotten. So if they want to buy a house, you live in an environment where bottom 2% in terms of income in the United States, the bottom 5%, for sure, the top 1%, all live better than John D. Rockefeller was living when I was six years old. John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. And today, you can get better medicine, better education, better entertainment, better transportation. You can do everything better than he could. It's astounding. That's in my lifetime. If you wanted to watch a football game, he still had to go there. I can sit there with this big screen, and they keep showing me the replay, so that explaining to me what happened and everything. Maybe everybody doesn't have a screen as big as mine, but damn near everybody has a screen or an iPhone or a computer or access to one. They have access. I mean, when I was born, the dentist didn't use Novocaine. I mean, you know, relative to the base, maybe more than, I mean, but there's no country that's done what our country's done. In seven, if you go back three of my lifetimes, you're looking at less than 1% of the world's population, closer to half of 1%. Half of 1% of the people in the world are sitting in this land. They don't work harder than people in all the rest of the world. I mean, you know, in terms of hours of unpleasant labor, everybody's got hours of unpleasant labor in those days, practically. They don't have, they don't come laden with gold. And, you know, they are half of 1%. And they work the same hours. They got the same IQs. They may be a little self-selected in terms of enterprise, in terms of going across oceans and things. Fast forward a couple of lifetimes, and they've got 20% plus of all the bounty in the world. That is something that has worked like nothing. Just imagine that. If you've gone to anybody, Constitutional Congress, in, you know, 1789, if you go to any one of the representatives there, and you said, I want to tell you what this place is going to look like, you know, in three more of your lifetimes, your great-great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, yeah, are going to be flying in the skies. They're going to be watching sports all over the world. They're going to be entertained. They're medicine. They'd, they'd have hold you off to a lunatic society. Just think of it. Everything, when Thomas Edison did all the things he did, he made some money. We're using it. It belongs to us. If you take what an hour of labor delivered to you, a hundred years ago, and what an hour of labor delivers to you now for you and your family. It's unbelievable. We've got a government that can tell capitalism what to do. What does it mean to me? It can buy more things for other people that are useful to them. And I don't, I have everything I want in life, you know, everything. So it, it's not evil. The federal government is the boss in the end. And they shouldn't screw up capitalism, and capitalism shouldn't screw up the federal government. It's very simple. <laughs> we had business, and it's gotten far, 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 unbelievably more productive for people. And the only thing it can do with what it produces is give it to other people. <laughs> it, it, it isn't like the 50 richest guys in the country can say, I'm just going to eat everything. <laughs> they, they, they're turning out products. I phone that I have, which I'm probably the least capable guy in the world of of working with it, but it makes life better. And we've got the best, so far, we've got the best system. We've got a better system than we used to have, and we'll have a better system 50 years from now. I've seen 91 years of it. <laughs> I've never seen a period where I didn't believe that, but it's unbelievable what has happened. I mean, just think of it. You know, we've had a civil war. We've had a Great Depression. We've had, we've had all these things. I'll guarantee you, I'll have something, you know, next year and the year after and the year after. But in a herky-jerky but dramatic matter. Business moves forward, government moves forward, more important, people move forward. The same thing I've told them 
before, but it's, they'll never get the message, most of them, but a few do, if you want to invest for the long term. And it's the S&P 500 index. And what's happened, of course, is that organizations like to grow. So they set up indexes on different industries, different countries. And as soon as you do that, you're violating basically what Jack Bogle said. He says, you don't know enough to pick the right businesses, which means you know, don't know enough to pick the right countries, the right, you know enough 